Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we're gonna paint this pretty landscape with a limited palette, and we're gonna use student watercolors, which are very inexpensive. These are from Joy Art. They're a very affordable brand found on Amazon, and I'm using five colors. I'm using ultramarine blue, burnt umber, sap green, rose, and yellow ochre. I'm gonna begin by wetting the top half of my paper with a large flat brush, and then I'm grabbing a number, um, oh, it's about one inch wide flat brush, and I'm mixing together ultramarine blue, and I'm gonna grab a little bit of burnt umber to kind of tone it down and gray it down a little bit. And I'm applying that to the top of the paper and then dipping my brush in water, I am pulling that color down. Make sure you work in horizontal strokes so that you will get a nice ombre blend. If you want it more intense like I do, go over and repeat that step again. Uh, when you're working with student grade watercolors in tubes, it's a great idea to use them fresh from the tube because then you'll get um, a more vibrant color and it will be much more similar to working with an artist grade paint. So keep that in mind. I always, um, suggest to my students to start off with a student grade paint and then go to an artist grade paint. Um, and there I just dabbed out some clouds with some paper towels. All you do is press and lift. Don't wipe your paper because you can end up damaging the surface of it, especially if you have a lesser expensive um, lower grade paper. So now I'm using a mixture of ultramarine blue and rose to make a soft purple. And I actually want to make sure I have a couple shades of purple. So I have some that are a little bit more on the blue side, some that are a little bit more on the purple side or pink side. And I even have a little bit of burnt umber in there to make sure it's not too vibrant. Now what I'm doing here is using that one inch brush and I'm kind of like using different edges and sides in the flat of the brush to make some uh, unique marks so that I can make this mountain range. Now this mountain range has snow on it so basically I'm negative painting or I'm painting around all the snow. I'm trying to use the white of my paper as best I can to achieve that look of far away distant mountains. Since the sky is still damp at this point, it will make anything I paint a little bit fuzzy. And that's fine because things that are further away from your eyes are always gonna look a little fuzzy. And then um, with that kind of watery grade purple, I'm just kind of filling in the top of the mountain, which is mostly snow, and also feathering down that color. Now I'm gonna wet the bottom of my paper, but I'm only wetting it where I'm going to want a lake. And as I tip it to the light, you can kind of see how I've wet this um, kind of oblong area of water and that's th that's gonna be a lake. So basically what I'm doing is putting in colors like I did in the top of the painting. I'm doing the sky color and the mountain colors. And now you're gonna see um, once I get the mountain in that I'm gonna have to fill in the rest of that area with something. I know I'm gonna have some trees growing. So I wanna make sure that I have those colors reflected as well. Closer to the coast or the shoreline rather, I'm going to have more golden greens. And then as you uh, work closer to the mountains, I'm going to end up with some evergreen trees. So I'm approximating what colors I plan on using. And I am using the chisel edge of my brush to basically dab in little lines. And those are going to indicate trees that I'll have uh, growing in the, um, you know, in the forest. So don't worry if you don't have it perfect, because maybe you don't know exactly where your trees are going to be. We just want to get some basics in here and we'll be able to adjust it a little bit later. When you're working in a large wet and wet area like this, you can continue to adjust and, um, play with your colors until the area starts to dry. This area is still wet, so I thought I know I needed some darker trees. I'm gonna go right ahead in and adjust those now. So I took the sap green and added some ultramarine blue to it, and that gives me a nice dark, um, almost huntery green color, and I'm using that in to pull in some kind of like tree shadows, and I'm just kind of starting it at the edge of the shoreline and just dragging it up into the uh, lake area. Now, once an area starts to dry, you really wanna leave it alone, let it dry completely, and then go over with another layer if you want to. But if everything is uniformly damp, you have like a uniform sheen over it, you can keep on working in that area. Now by this time, the sky is completely dry and I am dabbing in a ridge of trees that are further away on a hill. So these are kind of like a dark um, hunter green, almost indigo color. It's ultramarine blue and sap green. You can put a little bit of burnt umber in there if you need to darken it more. And then under that, I'm using sap green with a little bit of ultramarine on it, but you can see that it is much brighter. So as 
items come closer to your eyes are going to appear to be brighter and more colorful. So that's what I'm doing here to get some perspective. I'm making my colors a little bit brighter. I've switched to a number eight round so that I could have um, some good control in here. I did use uh, the number eight round like in that last layer of trees in the lake too. And I'm just putting in some um, different distinct lines to show like kind of the shadows of some trees and I can pull up a few distinct ones um, towards the edge of my paper too and that's going to help kind of frame everything out. Adding these shadows at the bottom of the tree line helps give a little bit of depth. It helps you um, kind of feel like the trees go on in the distance quite a ways and you've got a nice thick forest there. Now under the trees, I wanted to have some nice fresh um, either moss or grass growing in there. So what I'm using is yellow ochre and the sap green together and that's giving me a nice rich color. And I'm making it more yellow as I come around the lake and it's further lower in the paper which would be closer to the viewer and that brightness just helps you get a little more depth. And now I'm carrying some of that um, tree line across the page and this is just pretty much to fill in any white area because I'm going to be layering trees that are a little bit more distinct and a little bit closer in front. Now when I'm doing trees, uh, I like to hold my brush at a 90 degree angle with the paper, so I apologize when my hand gets in the way. Uh, but the reason I do that is because I get to use the entirety of my brush. I get to use all of the um, the qualities of that round brush. If you're right on the tip like I am right there, that's giving you the finest little tiny tips and dots of the paintbrush. And if I um, kind of angle my brush a little bit more, then I'm going to get the fat belly of the brush and I'll get wider, uh, thicker strokes. So that gives you a lot of versatility. And in fact, if I could only have one paintbrush to paint with, I would probably pick like a number eight round. That's what I have right here or a number 10 round because it's such a versatile brush. It's small enough that you can get really fine details with the tip of the brush but it's also it has enough hair in it that you can get some wide washes so now on that side we've got bigger trees because they start lower down in the paper meaning they're closer to us so they're going to reach up higher in the paper as well things closer to the viewer appear larger things further away from the viewer appear smaller at this point, I want to dry my painting so that I can set this layer of colors and I'll be able to glaze on top without worrying that anything else uh, will, you know, get disturbed too much. Now, of course, I could go in and lift any of these colors off if I wanted to, but as long as I'm working over top gently with a soft brush, I shouldn't run into any problems. I am mixing up a color to add into the water and it is ultramarine blue, sap green, and a little bit of burnt umber. The reason being is that I looked at the water and to me it didn't seem like it was um, dark enough. So by glazing, I don't lose all that work that I've already done. I can still see those colors underneath, but I'm able to add some movement by putting some ripples in the water and I'm also able to add some depth. So towards the shoreline, further away from us, kind of like up higher in the paper, I want that darker because that's going to pull our eyes in and then I want it um, lighter as we get to the bottom of the paper that would be closer to the viewer and so that's why I just have kind of just a few ripples there and I feel like it makes the lake seem a little bit larger and our scene a little bit uh, deeper and I can also use that color to add some sh more shadows into the woods and I can just kind of dab on some more detail on those three trees that were that are over to the right that kind of bookend the painting. The, uh, this is your painting. You can make your trees however you want. You can make your landscape however you want. You can add in details that I don't have, or you can omit details that you don't care for. Now, some tricks to make those greens feel a little bit more vibrant is to add a uh, contrasting color. The burnt umber has a little bit of a red tone to it, so that helps. But if you want a real nice pop, you can add a little bit of that rose color into your brown. That's going to give you... Um, a really beautiful maroon that's going to still look earthy and natural, but it's going to make your greens uh, really stand out quite a bit. So I think that's a nice little trick to add. It can look to one person like maybe some trees that have kind of died off because they get that kind of reddish brown color, or it can just be a kind of atmospheric look. But in, in any event, it looks great and helps you kind of distinguish some clumps of trees from others. Now I'm adding some final details onto the evergreen trees on the left. Basically, I made kind of a darker color with some blue sap green and a little burnt umber, and that is my um, just shadow color that I was adding in there. For a few final details, I want to add a little bit of uh, grass next to the shoreline because um, you'd have some nice, bright, healthy grasses there because they'd get plenty of water. And I'm doing that with a liner brush, and that is, again, a Creative Mark Mimic, uh, just like most of the brushes I'm using today. I'll link everything up in the video description 
description so you can see what I used. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this tutorial. I sure enjoy bringing these beginner lessons to you. And if you have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.